Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you might be. I am Nicole BC, and you, you and us have everything. everything. Bryn, thank you so much for being here. I know we had to take a very poopy baby. <laughs> to school, <laughs> breaking all we of the did, rules in order to make this happen. Single momming is a it was an adventure to say the least. Every day. So uh, welcome everybody. <laughs> Thank you for being yeah. here. I wanted to get Bryn Woodley, who is an illustrator, a graphic designer, a witchy mystic mama, and a really magical person onto the podcast because some of the people who listen put in the request when Bryn and I met, they, she, we were discussing queer witchy woman, <laughs> how best to introduce. Uh, yeah. Bryn had just quit a corporate gig, um, had been working in graphic design and illustration for years and years and years, wanted to go freelance, wanted to work on her own. At that point, that was very much what I was focusing on in my own business coaching. And the journey that Bryn has been on is nothing short of amazing and absolutely inspiring for anybody who is somewhere on that path of having had a creative gig within a corporate setting who wants to figure out what it looks like to work for themselves or potentially has been working them for themselves for a while and might think it's time to explore what a new J-O-B might look like. Because when we have boundaries, when we understand how we work best, when we're willing to advocate for ourselves, sometimes getting back into the corporate mix is not a bad idea. And in fact, you know, I've worked with a ton of different people who've been able to create their dream job when they approached me because they wanted to quit their job. And so I hope that we're going to have an opportunity to explore all of this. You know, usually I start with people's origin stories. So I would love to entertain that with you. Uh, I also tend to ask people if they consider themselves to be an artist. I think we already know what the answer to that question yes, is. So 100%. Yes. Bryn, why don't you take us either from how you think you got to this particular conversation today or really how your creative career got started, what it took for you to invest in you and to actually say yes to working for yourself, you know, taking off those golden handcuffs. I don't know if they ever felt like golden handcuffs for you, but um, no. yeah, I'll kind of let you choose your own adventure. <laughs> thank you so much for yeah. being here. Oh, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. So, wow. <laughs> Big question. So I think like the easiest way to ease into it is I, uh, my dad is an architect and he's quite famous within his field. I graduated um, with an English degree right at the at the, you know, during the Great Recession. And I was married at the time and, and couldn't find work. And so I ended up working for my dad, um, because that was secure and stable. I had other potential opportunities, because at the same time, I was also enrolled in the gra a graphic design program at the Art Institute, because I realized quickly that if I was going to be teaching teenagers the rest of my life, I was not going to be a happy person. So I, I think I enrolled in the Art Institute halfway through student teaching because I knew that just wasn't the way. Um, and then I ended up working for my dad because during the recession, that was a, a sure thing. So I ended up working for my dad. We moved to Seattle. And I, I joined a uh, small graphic design studio there. Um, and I started out there as a freelancer. And then all the freelancers were told that they were just readjusting, reshuffling things within that firm. And, and they decided to re reallocate funds to a project manager position. And so I said I would do that because, hey, I needed money. And so, but needless to say, that didn't work out well because I am not, in my heart of hearts, an administrative person. And by any means, like that does not bring me joy <laughs> at all. Um, and it's, it's something I can do, but it's not, it is energy sucking for me. So that did not go very well. And then the relationship with my ex-husband, it was very abusive, very toxic. And that was mirrored back to me in my relationship with my boss. So I was getting that kind of all on, on all sides. And I reached, reached out to my family and was offered my job with my dad back. And so I ended up to leave an abusive situation, went back to working for my dad and my family really rallied around me and, and really pretty much had to nurse me back to health. I was very 
deeply depressed and I, I became very malnourished during that time of my life. And then I ended up working for my dad for another, I think, six years. I, I probably worked for my dad in some professional capacity from the age of 17 to the age of 34. So that guy gives you just how impactful that was and, and how in many regards, and this is probably depending on who you ask, like they might roll their eyes at me. But um there's, to me, I feel like a late bloomer in many respects because of just how... Um, I hear that. <laughs> Not yeah. about you, but I can relate. <laughs> but just how long it took me for, for me to really be brave enough to step out into myself and really trust that I had something in me. And then in 2018, I... Like I had, I had the idea of my graphic design business called Bright Burns Studio. And I had that idea began in like around 2015. Like I was sketching logos for years while wow, that was in the background. And I was doing some freelance, but not very minimally. I was very busy while I worked for my dad. There really wasn't space for me to really grow or do much. I did, however... I would wake up really early, probably like four in the morning, beginning 2017, 2018. And I would start teaching myself how to hand letter. I started taking courses to refresh my skill set uh, in like Illustrator and other graphic design programs because I had become very rusty working for my dad because I wasn't doing primarily graphic design. I was in programs, but I wasn't doing what I love, which is branding and, and storytelling in that way. And so I had to really refresh myself. And so I was doing that. And I was, I did that for a couple of years where I would wake up at, at four in the morning and, and then I would work and I would do that for till 530 and go to the gym and then I would go to work. And then in 2018, I also decided to take on yoga teacher training. So I did, that was pretty crazy year. And I was, I did try and find other jobs, but I just didn't find a fit and I was just ready to leave. I didn't have a safety net. I had saved money. I also during this period of time, like, cause this was after my divorce, which also, if we want to go full on Astro Wu was during my, my Saturn return, I got divorced. That was when I really allowed myself permission to be fully curious about my spirituality and sexuality, because I had always been really fascinated and interested in tarot and astrology, but because I had grown up really identified as a Christian, I had turned away anything that was bad or evil and really wanted to be a good girl. And so I um, didn't really allow myself to be curious about the things that made me curious. And I also was deeply sexually suppressed. I I went to Christian college um, by choice because again, just so wanted to be good and be seen as good. And, and I think that's how I, as a child believed I would get love the best and easiest way. And so anyway, to say that all happened during my side return and that was all happening underneath the surface while I was working for my dad. And then December 31st of 2018, I decided I was moving. I was going to move to Denver because I've always been in love with Denver and I um, very quickly, I think within by the end of January, I had signed on house, my townhouse in Denver in March, because March is my birthday month. I left and I was like, I'm 34. I'm not going to be here another year. I'm not going to spend another year here. And then as soon as I left another, like the last podcast I did, which is funny, this is kind of be book ended by these experiences, but um, came out and I talked a lot about just generational patterns, epigenetics, um, just things that had led me to where I was and made it really hard to, for me to say yes to myself were expressed. And I and also the, um, the nitty gritty of my relationship with my ex-husband was aired in that podcast interview. And, and that con combined with me leaving, working for my dad. I had forgotten about that had podcast. You? Yeah. I well, not. I mean, I, I had, I didn't think about it in terms of the context of recording. Of course you haven't. Cause it was like wildly traumatic and disruptive to your entire life. But I did not yeah. think about when I asked you to do this, that 
like the the pivotal turning point that essentially forced you into like putting that podcast out. And um, hopefully this will be a much uh, gentler experience. Yes. But I thank you for reminding me about that because that was w- incredibly traumatic. Yeah. And one of the, I don't want to say that was a catalyst for us working with each other, but you were like very wounded. It was I very was. fresh, a very fresh wound for you. Um so I had, I had, well, thank you. I didn't, I, again, I did not think about like the mountain you have climbed in order to be able to probably do just another podcast again, well, let alone I think everything just, that's happened in between there. Yeah. But so anyhow, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we'll get into that. I think probably in layers, but yeah, so I did a podcast and um, when it, and it aired, it seemed, it just all coincided by the time when I left working for my dad and when I moved, it all happened mid-March, early April that year. It all seemed to like line up like dominoes. And also right then, I think I had lived in my new house, my new townhouse for maybe two weeks. And I went, I was just dealing with, obviously from all this happening, a lot of anger and frustration. And so I went and decided to go rollerblading around Sloan's Lake and I ended up breaking my left wrist, which is my dominant hand. And so that kind of put me out of commission for a while. And I, uh, so it took me a few months to even be able to get up a site and gather because I didn't really have any portfolio work to show um, looking for work because everything I had done for my dad wasn't really what I wanted to do. And so I needed to generate an entire new portfolio and website just to get in back into working and to really bring in work. And, um, so can I interrupt you and uh, we'll, I'll earmark this to come back to it, but I'm really curious and I think this will be useful for our listeners. What did you, I mean, that just feels like the perfect storm, right? Like you, you, give your dad notice, but you actually walk away from the income. You buy a new house and then you fall and break your wrist, which is basically your moneymaker. And I'm really curious at the time, if you can remember what was kind of going through your head and knowing what you know now with the experience mm-hmm. and wisdom that you have, what you would have told that, that version of yourself in that moment. At the time, I felt so lost. I, and I think I felt, I, I felt really wounded by because I was I don't I can't remember if I had been fully canceled by my family at this point but I I forgot about that detail as well because the podcast Mm -hmm. was incredibly revealing and your family took it like a personal attack yes Um, I uh, based on my memory of this I don't think you had been completely canceled yet but Maybe that's yeah. just because your family was not very like upfront. Like no one had learned yet how to be like authentic. Yeah. And, like, well, and I said, th- and- yeah. And I think like it was just modeled for me in relationship that to have a relationship, you sacrifice a part of yourself to make the relationship work, mm-hmm. you know? And so to make a relationship work, no one gets to really be their authentic selves. And I think that was, that was generational. That wasn't just my parents. And I was, I was speaking to things that were very revealing, very confronting, but they didn't want to do that. And I, and so I got called out as a liar, lots of things. And, um, but also simultaneously was the, the effort to recreate and build, rebuild the relationship also got placed completely on my, on my shoulders. So, and then just to kind of bring it back to the question. So you have a broken wrist, Mm -hmm. your family has kind of abandoned you you have no income, you have a mortgage, uh, and you're kind of, I mean, like living in, I mean, I know you weren't that far from Denver, but you're in a new community essentially. Yeah. And you're feeling very wounded. I mean, I heard like, does victimized resonate? Oh yeah. In that moment. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely felt like a victim. And so, and just really lost. And I was like, I felt because, um, I'm like, who am I if I can't draw? Like, I was really worried wow. that I wasn't even going to get. So identity um, crisis as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't <laughs> even, I was like, I was like, how do I even, like, if I can't, like, I just left to do this, do my, be myself, basically. How, but if I can't do this, what do I do? And thankfully, that wasn't the case. It, I, I just it felt so lost, felt so wounded, felt abandoned. 
Did any a part of you ever want to just like give up and go back and get a job? It just didn't feel possible. Didn't feel like in the oh, realm wow. of possibilities. That's right. Okay. And, and I also like, I don't think it, I had it fully yet. It was, it would come later. We'll fill in the, the blanks here, but what would you tell that version of yourself now? You wouldn't be in a situation if you couldn't handle it. Ooh, I love it. Yeah, I think, I think, and I've had a lot of, we'll go there, but I've had a lot of instances this year where I've really been able to reframe Mm. all the things I've been through that have, I think in the past, really, in my mind, I held up more of a mantle around, you know, damaged and broken. And I've been able to reframe those things now and see that in reality, no, I'm a tenacious badass, like that those things I think would break a lot of people, but they haven't broken me and they've made me feel broken. And I think there's a big difference in that, you know, to feel like, because I definitely have been victimized in my life and repeatedly in numerous occasions, like, but it's, it's getting to a place where you step outside of that and you want to create a new story because you believe one is possible for yourself, not because of what you've been through, but because of how you overcome what you've been through. This feels relevant because I know you think that you think of yourself as a storyteller and that is your true work as an artist and a creator. How important do you think those experiences are for your art or for art in general? And this is my bad habit. I ask like million part questions, but, and I know you and I have talked about this. It's very tempting for the artiste to kind of get lost in that spiral of tragedy creates art, you know, does tragedy beget the art or does the art beget the tragedy? And and sometimes I know I certainly relate to this in my youth, almost like manufacturing those experiences because they make life feel so much more <laughs> exciting and romantic. The soaring highs and the plummeting lows is another artist friend of mine described that experience as. And when you kind of get to this place where you're at now, we normalize this experience and we recognize that by expecting the big wins to the point where it should feel normal and also recognizing the big losses don't mean we fucked up or we did something wrong or we can never get back to the state of equilibrium again. It really starts to like flatten this, this wavelength, if you will, and which can feel like boring. And so I'm wondering, like, in terms of your own pain and your own journey, when you reflect back on it, and especially now, like just in the the, the very regular blow ups, I think every mom can relate, new mom especially can relate to, how has that pain informed your art? Or how do you use art to transmit that pain? I I think when you're in that pain cycle, it does, like, there is a gravitas to... Yes everything you do and it and there's like a it's a catharsis but it's really hard to create in a state of depression (laughs) so you know and it's really it's really hard to to really generate anything consistent from a place of destruction when you're constantly being pulled down and, and brought low it's really hard for there to be that level of drama consistently it's you know and I I think I've lived in that cycle a lot. Like I think every creative has, which is why I wanted to call attention to it because on the yeah. one time it does have gravity, like it, it does feel important and yes. it feels, um, necessary. And, and I, I remember the moment when I stopped really tuning into that frequency of drama and I was like, Oh, life's kind of boring. And then you get to the point where you're like actually waking up in a bed that's comfortable with the roof over my head, knowing that like I'm safe and secure is fucking magical and I can feel ecstatic bliss. But it took me a minute to kind of get there and find that joy and that ecstasy in like the, the banal, if you will. Um, but I, I, I remember like in that, in that, like evolution thinking like, Oh, well, it's like really boring if I'm not in like a state of heartbreak or like mania. <laughs> like, right. Well, but to your point, and I, also very unsustainable. It's very unsustainable. It's, it constantly brings you to a space of heartbreak, which you can argue for against. I mean, I've like definitely see that parallel in my personal and professional life of, 
of, of being drama seeking or creating drama from an unconscious space, right? But I think drama is exhausting. I'm in a, one, now I'm a mom, but I've always been an old soul and really have like, want to live like an 80 year old woman, like always, like I've always been an early riser, early to bed, early to rise sort of person. And that makes me fucking happy because I get to have a morning that, and that's my favorite time of day. And I really don't like sharing it with us anybody and unless I really like them um so and that that's very few people when you're able to create and and be in a space where you can find joy in a space of ease you can create and generate a lot more from that place than you can when you're constantly bringing your space to your yourself to a space of survival um Mm that you have to triumph from. And like, there's a a sense of like triumph and victor victory in that space, but it's so unsustainable and it's so exhausting. And, and when you're operating from that space too, you also don't create a sense of stress in yourself because you don't believe that it's going to last. So how did you kind of bring it back to the, the origin story just in terms of, so you, you, I'm assuming your wrist started working again. Yes. You started stepping out your own business and you've talked a lot about like the joy in your work, but as every creative business owner knows, (laughs) most of the work is not your art or your, you know, your quote unquote joy. So I'm curious how, like, I mean, I kind of want to bring it back to the, like starting your own business and building this trust. And also like, how important is, is it to you in, in, like if you don't love every single thing you do, especially as a business owner, how do you balance that? Do you reframe it to find joy in everything you do? Like, yeah, just kind of bring us back to that moment and and what it was like getting this all running. Because you, yeah. you got to a pretty amazing, amazing place, which yeah. is one of the reasons I wanted to have Bryn on this podcast is so that you, the listener, could be inspired. You know, I call this podcast, the relatables, and it's important to me to talk to people who feel like one of us who have done the damn thing and who you can listen to their story and their experience and their learnings and think like, yes, like I can apply this as soon as I stop listening or right this very moment. So anyhow, that was just a little background on, on Bren, but um, yeah, sorry. Again, 18 part yeah, questions. I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I think I'll just fast track it with some bullet points just so it's easy. But yeah, so I start my business, I end up t- taking a bunch of contracts, kind of find work that way through various recruiters. And then 2020 hits, I have a, I'm, I have a contract just that just dies, I freelance while simulta- simultaneously door dashing to just pay the bills, become very indebted during this period of time, because I'm living off credit cards. And then at the end of 2020, I get a, I finally get a job offer and and to a contract I had previously. I went back to work for them beginning of 2021 and was taking other contracts. And then I was on a contract to hire with this one contract um, and that fell through because they had someone internally decide to move to Denver and they took my spot basically. And I had, then I had another uh, contract basically come to me privately and tell me that they loved my work and that they wanted to hire me directly. And so that became like a full, a full-time consulting gig where I basically played creative director to this company. That's a global company. And that enabled me to have really like to be at the six figures mark to hire an administrative system to do the things that I'm not good at and hate. So, so I think it's like, I figure out a way to do things that I didn't like. I, I always have found a way to pay an accountant because I'm not a numbers person, never will be. Uh, so knowing that that is just a business expense that's necessary. So I always, so I think knowing what your weaknesses are and your strengths, my mm-hmm. like never, never give me numbers. Like do not come to me for math problems. I will not help you. Um, I have trouble calculating uh, gratuity on a check. So when I get a bill, so don't come to me. And then just having 
like other people, like I would have friends who would give me some accountability or we would kind of be accountability build buddies, like while we're creating our own things. Like if I couldn't afford an assistant, I would reach out. I would do a couple, I had different friends or I, I would, I just had, I would reach out to people who were kind of in the entrepreneurial space. And I think this is what was really good for me for co-working places and Slack and then having, building a network of people. If I couldn't afford it, I could have people who I could go to like lawyers who could, I could do their 30 minute freebie. And I, you know, so I think it's just being like savvy. And then when I had the funds to pay for an assistant to have, to help me with like my systems to be more streamlined, uh, just give me feedback on that. That was a big game changer, but I think just knowing what your weaknesses are and figuring out a way to like help yourself and then find people to help you at different levels. Cause I think, I think like, even though we kind of go into it as an entrepreneur, like a solo person, we cannot do this alone. So I think it's just knowing that like you cannot build success on your own shoulders. It just doesn't work. You will burn out and you won't want to, you will quit because you won't feel supported. And I think we all need that support to feel successful and to be successful. Before I kind of ask you about circulating from like really being your own boss to getting back into working in organization, you said something earlier. Well, you said a couple of things that I want to dig into. You grew up in a family that Um, you know, essentially the head of household was also an entrepreneur and small business owner. I mean, I know he ran a very, very successful, large and um, comparison architecture firm. And then also that there was, there was, you had not been modeled healthy uh, relationship in terms of like codependency or interdependence. And so I'm wondering how this upbringing both in entrepreneurship and codependency influenced your own relationship with your business and your clients. (laughs) I would say that boundaries for me have been the hardest thing, like just personally, professionally, because they weren't modeled. And my dad in his business at work, that is where he shines and where he is fully himself, fully embodied at home. That's not who he is. My mom tried when I was little, tried to go back to work. She tried to find, like go back to school and figure out what her thing was when I was five years old. So I saw her try and, and, and get scared and not really believe in herself, I think, or, or not really give herself permission to ask herself what she really wanted. And, and so I saw both things modeled to me and I, I've played both roles in myself. Like, and so my mom really supported my dad in his dream. Um, and that's what my mom did, um, while being a stay at home mom. So I saw that and then I, and my dad got to be, live out his dream and be fully supported. And so I've seen that dynamic played over and over in me fully believing in myself, being really difficult, really wanting someone to come alongside me and and support me in my dream when it's had to be up to me to make that happen. Like really struggling to believe I was worth what I'm asking when I'm pricing and really, and that's just an evolution because money is an energetic exchange and just boundaries around work, like as an entrepreneur, like, cause I, cause when you're, when it's just you, you're doing all the things you're wearing all the hats. And so it's normal to like work a 12 hour to 14 hour day, but I, that's not sustainable. And I know for anybody who becomes an opportunity entrepreneur you're doing it for because you want a balanced life and you have a passion Um, and it's finding how you find equilibrium between the passion that drives you and having a life that supports it so I think it's it's really all those things like boundaries like believing and trusting in myself saying yes to me believing I deserve what I wanted and that was possible that's probably been the hardest biggest and that's like probably going to be a lifelong journey, but I'm like in such a huge turning point with that space. Just like in this year, it's been pretty remarkable. What's been so remarkable about it this year? I think just like this year, because I was able to get a job after being trying to return from maternity leave and then being told that my position wasn't available and then finding a full-time position that gave me stability while also being a mom and I had a lot of freedom and flexibility. So I think doing that, I really had to, I think I had, I don't know when it happened, but I, I think probably early on, I had added single mom to the list of reasons why I didn't deserve what I wanted. Mm. 
and and as another reason why I wasn't worthy of what I wanted. And and I think what's been remarkable about this year is it's been reframing that um, again, not as a reason of why not worthy, but like like why am worthy? Because I think like anyone who becomes a parent, like it is such a it is not a decision you make from a logical place. It is a heart decision completely. And with everything I've experienced, it's my, like, I'm not going to put on my son, my stuff to as much of my ability. And I'm not going to take these cycles with me or put them on him. They are breaking. They're not um, going to be generated and created anymore. So owning that I can be in this place that I believe is temporary as a single mom and that also I can simultaneously be fooling myself and be powerful. And I can model that for my son. Beautiful. Thank you for giving us that insight. I kind of wanted to jump back a little bit because the maternity leave slash find a job, you know, if you're working for yourself, where does the maternity leave come in? And then Yeah. Well, let's start there. So kind of bring us up to speed because you're working for yourself. You've gotten this amazing contract position. You're essentially a creative director. Is that what you took maternity leave from? And then was it simply being a mom that really drove you to like get a J-O-B as opposed to going back into business for yourself? Yeah. What was that journey like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So it was the consulting gig that I took maternity leave from new slash. I did not become a single mom. That was not my plan. <laughs> um, I don't think it's anybody's plan, but it definitely wasn't mine. And my son was very much a marvelous surprise. Like, cause I think me and his dad had been dating all of six, eight weeks when I got pregnant. So that kind of gives you an understanding of kind of the, it was, it was tumultuous as we kind of already touched on with, you know, the bringing drama into one's life <laughs> to create things. But yeah, so I, I took maternity leave from that position. Um, and I was told when I left, like that there would always be a position for me and that they loved me. And, and then I went on maternity leave and there, and because I think it was a consulting gig and it was based, um, in the UK, it wasn't, there was no, like, um, I think, and our agreement was done. So it wasn't, they didn't feel an obligation to me. And, and basically I, I was told via Slack that I didn't have a position anymore. This was a this was a self funded maternity leave. From it memory, self- you saved up, and so when yes. you like, and I love that that you gave yourself maternity leave. I think that's super powerful. For three months. Three months. Yeah. I gave myself three months. Full on. Um, and I remember you saving up for that as well. Um, but yeah, like you you go back and um, there's no position and you now have a three month old baby. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. And what my maternity next? leave is my savings. So um, at that time, like things really quickly, I th- like shift with me and his dad. I think we lived together maybe 10 days. It did <laughs> not last very long. Like my mom and dad and I started looking for property to be closer because I just knew I needed more support and at this point we had um, reconciled I just felt like I would have more regrets not having them in my life and not having them meet their grandson and having them see me as a mom than I would that, that I would if I had a relationship with them so that for me became really important and that was a huge change for me and so I looked at um, cities closer to where they were where my sisters and my, my both my parents closer to where they live so I could have that support beautiful I wanted to you mentioned something earlier and I kind of wanted to like loop this all into another multi-part question but oftentimes entrepreneurs especially business owners can feel shame around going and getting a job and you had said that like you were under a lot of debt, so you were doing DoorDash, which is another thing some people can experience a lot of shame around, not just the the DoorDash, but the debt. And so I'm wondering for you and how it kind of showed up for you and if it if it did kind of transform. For me personally, like work is work is work. I remember I got into a, a big fight with one of my ex uh, boyfriend is like an exaggeration of what that situation was, but 
the last time we spoke was because what I had also, I mean, I think we all got our yoga teacher training at some point. So I was like working at a yoga studio, kind of climbing my way up and I was cleaning the bathrooms and cleaning the studio. And he, I was also, you know, on the, the, this was kind of the very end of my music career. So on the one hand, I am like hanging out with A-listers and (laughs) making, you know, doing, doing crazy stuff in the music industry. And then on the other, I'm like scrubbing toilets in a locker room and he just couldn't reconcile that. And like, we literally got into a fight about the fact that I would like stoop so low as to be a cleaner. And I, it had just never occurred to me that anybody would think about it like that. It's just work. And at the end of the day, like it was an end, it was, you know, means to a desired end. But, and, and I've worked with a lot of different people in terms of their money around energy and how something like DoorDash or Airbnb or these like share economy portals, shall we describe them as, ways that you can just simply start making more money now are incredibly powerful because if you just have a job or even if you are getting started in freelance, you might not understand that it, you know, money is currency and it is literally flowing all of the time. And so by playing with these different experiences, we can open the door, hence the portal to these unpredictable ways of actually just turning on the money faucet as I like to think about it so that it just flows in. But like I said, a lot of us have some weird shame and stories around it. So I'm wondering when you were in debt, what the story was around your debt, what the story was around your DoorDash, what the story was for you around getting a job after having been a successful freelancer. So yeah, if you could share some Mm -hmm. of that, that would be, I think, very insightful. DoorDash, it was just like, I, one, that was a fun, it was an interesting sociological experiment seeing what people eat, especially here in the U S. Um, but I, um, I think it was more just like with DoorDash, it just, I felt like proud of myself. Um, cause prior to that I had worked retail and then 2020 happened and that while also simultaneously working contracts. And so, and I had a, a boyfriend at the time who thought that was really low bar for me to do, but I'm just like, I don't know. I have a dream. I need to figure out how to make it work. And I think that's kind of been my mindset the whole time. It's just like, like I've never been, I'm very much a dreamer, but I'm like, you have a dream. You are, you then have a commitment to make it happen. Yeah. You know? So I, that was kind of with DoorDash. I, I mean, and I just thought it was kind of funny because like I said, it was like a sociological experiment to see people eating at places called Fat Shack that I had never heard of and probably would never know about if it weren't for DoorDash. And then with taking um, a job after kind of doing my own thing for a while, it wasn't me saying goodbye to my dream. I think that was the reframe that I had. Um, it was like, it's just put on pause. You know, I have a baby. And that was also a big dream of mine has always been to be a mom. So it was, how do I hold both these dreams simultaneously? And that's gonna, that's still kind of an ongoing negotiation. This is what I think our, your needs change as like in different seasons. And this is these, my needs, I need one thing that was stable um, solid. I need to know I had a stable income coming in so I could be stable for my son and for myself. Um, and in this time where I'm also going through like custody negotiations, you know, and that was extremely stressful, still like dealing with that and, and not feeling great about that feeling do. And I, I'm still carrying shame about that. Honestly, it's not like, I know I've figured it out in layers. And at one point I'll get to a place where that dot, that won't be existent. And I trust that in myself. Cause I just, um, I believe that everything is figure outable, you know, at, to, to quote Marie Forleo, but it's, it's really, I think trusting that, like, I know I have the stuff to make it happen, even if it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so I think it's, it's, it's that um, piece of it. We thank you for sharing that as well. It's not easy to talk about the stuff that we feel shame around. And this is more of my own like personal intel on you. So I think your answer to this is going to be uh, very supportive for, again, our listeners. But how do you overcome the experience that when you look around, you don't have what you want? <laughs> And quite honestly, it can be a reflection of the way that you're thinking and the way that you're feeling. 
And you know that when we can shift, when we can reframe, I I love what you said, like I have a dream and that is a commitment. And so even though you might look around and your reality does not look like your dream, Hmm. knowing that our reality is based on, you know, choices and decisions and feelings from yesterday or, or many days before. Yeah. How did you stop? Uh, I was going to say feeling sorry for yourself. That's a very like flippant way of describing it. But when I think about like broken wrist, alone, and no income, Bryn, and then the Bryn that is now the mother, the business owner, the creative director, the person that recognizes the home, you know, multiple homeowner now that y- you can create your reality and your dreams are, you are worthy of your dreams and they are accessible. And in fact, you can have anything that you want. Like, how do you kind of rectify that discrepancy when you find yourself in a new experience where you look around and you're like, well, shit. (laughs) Mm. So I think there have been two really significant points in my life where I've like looked around and like, this is not what I wanted. The time leading up to my divorce and during my divorce, that was one period of time. Like, and just also for the record, I am like, I think I'm highlighted, but like my ex-husband, and this is in the, that also the other podcast, but it's, um, you know, it was very abusive that, um, made me kind of, a like if you were to take a person and they were to become a whisper, that's kind of what I had become. And then becoming a single mom, like, cause I really wanted a partner and a family and I really wanted that to be about love. And that was, that hasn't, that wasn't my experience. And so, um, and I really wanted like soulful and embodied person. My baby's father isn't that, and just is operating from a very limited capacity. So at those points, it's been like, well, how did I get here? And, and that has brought, you know, there's a lot of grief in that, but there's also then I think the need for like self-reflection and inquiry because I chose somehow, I know like unconsciously I chose this reality. So how did I get here? And how do I not make this never happen again? Like it's been, it's been really about me unpacking all the patterns. I knew the last time I dated, I was choosing a pattern, but I didn't understand why it was still attractive. I do now um, because I really committed to really looking at um, all my patterns. So I have the ability to choose differently. I felt like a victim of my pattern, I think. And, and now I have confidence that I, because I, of why I was choosing the pattern. So it's no longer attractive that I have confidence that moving forward, I will choose differently because I'm no longer operating from the same rubric. It's different. It's changed. I was just going to say, I felt that in my gut. That was prophetic. Thank you. But yeah, I think it's like whenever you get to a place in your life where it's like, how did I get here? This is not what I wanted. It's letting yourself feel all the feelings about that first, Mm. because I think you need to feel all the things. And then second, doing the work to act, to really understand why and how. And then from that place, believing that you can create something new and different. Mm. I, I think those three things are really important to feel it all, to be curious and, and then believe something new is possible. Oh man. Uh, like I said, I'm having like a full body response to that. Thank you. I experience it similarly when I think about like my quote unquote mistakes. I ask myself like, what energy was I in? What was my mindset? What did I want? What did I think this was going to get me? Why did I externalize my own power? And I think it's really powerful to recognize discovering what you don't want is a really great way to get closer to what you do. Some people feel like they don't have that dream. They don't know what their purpose is. They're trying to figure that all out. And you you probably have a pretty good understanding of what it is you no longer want to experience. And that honestly, yeah. just simply making different decisions will guide you much closer towards what you want. So I think that's really powerful. And it's funny, I was thinking like, okay, so now let's start the interview. <laughs> One of the reasons I love like getting to chat with people who I know so intimately is that I get to, it, this is like actually our catch up because you it totally uh, and is. I have both, yeah, have been like crazy on all sorts of different timelines. But you, you gave me the segue, Olive Branch. You talked about doing the work. And I'm curious, like, as I'm 
not going to ask an 18 more question. What do you think your work is? Like literally your job? Like in the world? Like, are we talking work or are we talking purpose? Well, you know, I think the, for the people that I speak with, and I don't want to, I don't want to, what's the word, like lead you in this place, but you know, if someone were to ask you what you do, they want to know what your job is. And you'd be like, I'm an illustrator, but I don't think that's what you conceptualize your work as. And my guess, because this is how I feel, is the work is my work. And Mm. my work is different than your work (laughs) because we're different people who are wired very differently and also have a fairly clear understanding of what our purpose is. And as much as you can ever really, it's like a pretty esoteric concept out there, but um you can't be successful. You can't even do your job without, I don't think, without doing the work. So most of the time when I ask the people that I get to speak with here in this context, what, what is your work? It's a, it's sort of a very like purpose driven explanation, if you will, put it in like cheesy new age terms. But let me ask again, Bren, having now given you the answer, (laughs) what, uh, what is your work? I think at the, end of the day it's really to bring everything I'm learning and share it through art and story words and art have always been my two things like I have like I said I have a a bachelor's in English so I am also a writer and that is but art and words all my life those have been who I am Um, and I think that's part of why graphic design is such because it's, it is that it's making art of words. And, and so I, I think it's really to share what I'm learning in a more collective, broader way through art and words. What is your creative process? Messy. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Chaos. Chaos. Yeah. So it depends on like what it is. Like, with branding, it's a lot like because I spend a lot of time in the, the initial stage of sketching and drawing because that is my favorite place. Like messy fingers, messy hands. That's where I think the best ideas come from is from that space, and then refining it on computer and it evolves from there. I don't show things that I don't think are strong to clients. Like I used to have um, like a rule where I had to show like you know three concepts but if I only get really two like I've gotten places like if I only get one or two really strong from after doing all that distillation in myself that's all I share because I want to be proud of what I share to the client and I want them to be proud of it and I'm not going to share if I'm not proud of it with writing it's feeling all the things and then sharing trying to do more of that more writing um, because I miss it and 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 my life right now is messy so it's chasing my toddler while he runs around with my lipstick tube writing on tile some mornings and chasing him with a washcloth, hoping he doesn't stain anything. So it's just messy. Uh, that's funny because my next question was going to be like, well, what's your routine? But as a creative, as somebody whose livelihood is dependent on your creativity, how do you call in the muse? And this might also intertwine. I know the answer to this question, but if... How does spirituality play into this process of potentially routine or creating the space to create? How does it influence your work? Again, 18 part question. I really got to sort of figure out how to stop doing this. (laughs) Um, Like I am very much a habits person. Like I'm a Pisces, but a Virgo rising. So I need like creativity needs a structure to thrive. So I really believe in, in creating that structure. And I think if you can create structure for yourself as an entrepreneur, you you create your more freedom for yourself. So mm-hmm. I um, am an early, early, like, like my alarm goes up at 430 because that gives me two hours before my son gets up. That is two hours that I have to myself to journal, to meditate, to read whatever I want to read. And, and that allows me to like, I've always craved and needed a lot of space and time for myself I'm a very introspective person. I need that space. If I don't get it, I'm, I'm not a happy human and I'm not, you don't want to be around me. And so I really protect that space. And, um, and then when my son wakes up, I'm really good for him. And I'm, I can be like, good morning, darling. I'm so happy you're awake, you know, and really mean it. 
and not be, you know? So I really think, and then movement for me is crucial. Like on the days that he goes to daycare and he stays at daycare, I work out during my lunch hour because that's when I have childcare. And if I have to work a little bit later when I put him down, I can do that. But most nights I just, I work, I drop him off at 730 and I work from eight to noon. I go to the gym or I go to yoga and I come back from um, yoga or movement when I can get it. Like I don't do it every day, but the days I do it, it's like, that's, I try to keep that as my routine because that just helps me stay in a state of flow. I get, again, for the astro um, woo weirdos who are like me, who like all this stuff, my my Mars is in Aries. I, I got to go. Like we got to move. We got to make things happen. So if I can't move, I get frustrated in every way. So just making that part of my recipe for feeling good and getting in the flow is important. And, and I, I'm somebody who needs um, an intense workout that feels really good to me. Some people don't like that, but for me, I really need it again. Like I said, Mars and Aries. So giving myself that allows me to like be in a space of flow a lot easier and not force it. And then I work from one to five, I pick up my son at five. And then on Tuesdays, Thursdays, his dad has him. And so I have, it feels like I have extended days those days. And so I usually work a little longer those days and, and then like tidy clean up food prep for the next day. Cause I pack all his lunches, do laundry, like, um, when he goes down at seven 30 and then I do that for the next hour. And then I usually go to bed. <laughs> so yeah, like that's up at four 30. Yeah. That's my day. So. Well, and thank you so much for creating this space for us in your day. I know, I mean, I think everybody knows how busy you are now. Um, I just wanted to kind of circle back to one thing and then we're at, you know, over just over an hour now. So we'll probably say adieu. But mm-hmm. what I'm hearing are boundaries. And something you had said was like boundaries were one of the most challenging things for you to learn. You're creating boundaries in your day for your own routine, for your own ritual, for your own practice to then create the space to be creative and to be, you know, a business owner or a, a successful member on a team. How, you know, again, like for someone who said they struggled with boundaries, how have you gotten to a place where you can use boundaries to support yourself? I think I've had significant people who've been boundary teachers for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And that can be those that can mean they've been challenging people for me because they've taught me a lot from conflict because I have like my son's father has really been a boundary teacher for me. My parents have been boundary teachers for me. I've had friends be boundary teachers for me, like really, because I've been very conflict avoidant through probably the majority of my life don't really enjoy conflict. I don't think anybody really likes, mm, I don't know. Some people do. I don't. Yeah. Um, I don't think they like it. I think they need it for a reason that we don't understand as if we're not into conflict as some kind of a validator or like <laughs> vent. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. I interrupted. Please. Keep um, so I think knowing that and giving myself the, uh, the permission to show up perfectly and make mistakes as I'm learning something and do thing, doing things that are hard for me. There are times like I have conversations that are difficult for me and I'm like, oh, I didn't really hold my own in that. And I can be upset with myself for not, or, and I think too, cause when boundaries aren't something that you were modeled or really shown how to do, like you learn about boundaries and then you go full on wall. Like it's like castle, yeah. like, um, and that's definitely been my, I'm trying now to just be compassionately firm while I set the boundary. And it, and again, it's also like where you are, like people can feel like if you set a boundary from anger versus when you're in a state of grace, it's, but you can, it's like one of those things that's when it's an embodiment, you can't fake it. So it's, mm. um, you know, I think it's a, just a learning. It's a, it's been a huge learning curve for me. I'm still not the best at it. So I think it's just, I think it's also believing I deserve to have my boundaries respected. I think it's, mm. that was the thing too. It's like, it was one learning about boundaries, but also believing that I deserve for my boundaries to be mm. respected because my known had been stolen from me. So like, so that is a big thing too. Like believing that 
believing you deserve respect, believing that Mm. what you want and need should be respected. Like that took a lot of time and it's still being integrated. Yeah. Boundaries. I, you know how I always used to say like balance is a verb. I've started also saying boundaries are a verb because they often do get built in a place of, you know, anger and not necessarily grace. And that's not a bad thing. I think as long as we bring awareness to that and recognize this is going to be like a really hardcore, like you described it as almost putting about laying a bunch of bricks. That's how it's going to show up at first. But then once we believe in ourselves and deserve, believe that we deserve that respect of that boundary, we can, we can, you know, pull it back in a little bit. We can take down the bricks, maybe build a window to play that analogy through. But oftentimes when you start building boundaries, you're going to get a very like level one, two response out of the people who feel like they're getting resisted, which means they're going to throw a little temper tantrum and act like a crying baby, crying baby. And that's okay too. Like, you got to teach people how to treat you, right? And when you start saying no to someone who's only ever heard yes, or potentially, you know, to kind of bring it back to something you had mentioned before, was attracted to you in a space where you were much more of a yes person and a people pleaser, of course, that person's going to experience that boundary as being like rude, or they're going to personalize it because they're not, they are a boundary bully. I'm going to steal that from you. And then they learn and then they recognize this actually actually isn't about you. It's from Terry Cole. She has a whole okay. book, I think, Terry called Cole. Boundary Boss. And she has... Oh, okay. We'll have to like, read that. I, I don't know if you... I think a, I I built yeah. a People Pleaser's Guide to Building Better Boundaries workbook. Um, yeah. But I don't know Terry Cole's work, so I'll have to do some She's research around that. phenomenal. Highly recommend. Cool. She also has a podcast. I think it's under this... I think it's just the Terry Cole podcast. But yeah, okay. she... That's all, that's all she does is boundaries. Oh, okay. There you go. Well, uh Speaking of where to find people, and as we kind of round out this particular conversation, Brent, if people wanted to discover your art or work with you, follow along with your own adventure in life, what's the best the best way for them to find you? So like um, the life adventure, Instagram is the best place. Ooh, um, I love that. I miss that rebrand. That's very cool. Um, well, adventure. you said where you can find Balmy yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking like Sorry, Brave Brand Studios, Brand. but no, but I love Brave that. Brave Brand Studios is like where you can follow. Um, I I have a private personal account that I'm deleting and I just want everything to be in one place and integrated. So everything will be to Brave Brand Studio. Um, you can go, hopefully by the time this airs, my website will be up. <laughs> so you can go to um, bravebrandstudio.com um, to see more of like design work. And then I have prints available for sale on Etsy.com. And again, it's just brave brand studio. And, um, I'm working to actually have that be thriving. It's kind of been the up, but not, not really, really just kind of there. (laughs) So I'm working to make that more of a, um, revenue source. So please go there. I will be, I'm simultaneously working on more art and prints while I'm working on my website to give myself breaks when I get scared. Um, because my website is really scary for me. (laughs) I've had to have friends hold my hand while I, while I do the thing. So just know, like, I, I think maybe just normalizing every new layer of yourself will also call and will feel a little scary and that's okay. Put all the links and everything you just shared. So thank you again so much for taking some time out. And I know you're going to go work on your website right now. So uh, I am. if there are scary stuff, you know, I'm here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And yeah. uh, I just think what you've created and what you continue to create and what you've overcome and the the wins that you've gotten to celebrate are just so inspiring. And a lot of people listening are either at the beginning of their journey or standing shoulder to shoulder in solidarity with both you and I in terms of this like very tumultuous creative adventure that we are all on. So Bryn, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being here. Thank you for continuing to create and for your beautiful art that you put into this world. I think it's absolutely stunning. I encourage everybody to listen, to go check out the Etsy shop, to check out your website and your portfolio for anybody in need of illustrative graphic design for sure. But you know, some people, I think that corporate background is also incredibly helpful, especially when you do go freelance. And so for people in need of a very dependable (laughs) deadline oriented designer, I think Bryn is also your girl. Yeah, for sure. I can go full on very clean and corporate aesthetic 
or we can go super woo and whimsical. So yeah, the whimsical can, stuff. And and that's the fun thing about checking out your portfolio. You'll get to see some of the superstars that Bryn has actually worked with. So thank you again, Bryn. 